Well, good day, everyone. I'm Bruce Strominger at Project ECHO with the One Health Workforce Next Generation Consortium. And I want to uh, welcome you all, give a first welcome to this COVID-19 One Health update for the Africa One Health Network. And I'm gonna run through a few housekeeping items. First, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully you can see this. I'm gonna go right to uh, the interpretation line for notre collègue francophone. There's a interpretation button on bouton de interpretation in the, in the bottom of the zoom bar at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that, you'll have a choice of French or English. So most of the presentations will be in English and there will be translation into French. We will have one presentation in French. And so everyone who speaks English will need to click on the English interpretation line and you'll hear back translation from French into English. So if any questions about that, please chat us in the, in the toolbar or in the chat function. So we really want to encourage everyone, if you have the bandwidth, to turn on your camera. We're trying to build a community of practice and being able to see everyone and have this virtual face-to-face -face get together really helps us build that community. So if you can, please turn on your camera. But while you're not speaking, please keep your microphone muted so that we can hear the speakers clearly. We also want to encourage everyone to rename yourself with the name of your, with your name and your organization and your country, if, if there's room, so we know who you are and what organization you're with and where you're from. If you have any Zoom IT problems, please chat uh, Echo IT uh, so that we can help you if we can. And uh, also, in the chat function, and I'm going to actually, or someone's going to help mute uh, someone there. If you've got any questions or comments, please put them in the chat so that we can address those when we come to the discussion portion of our, our session today. For those who are using the Socion PDA participant app, the QR code to log in for starting is to the right. So please scan that using the PDA participant app. The instructions for downloading that were in the announcement and we'll share those also in the chat. There will be an end QR code uh, toward the end of the session and I'll stay on for a few minutes afterwards and keep that up uh, for people who need help with that. The presentation slides uh, and the recording will be shared through an email after uh, in, in follow-up also, for those using the PDA app, they'll get copies of those instantly at the end of the session. We are recording the session and your attendance is consent to be recorded, so thank you. There will be continuing professional development credits through the University of New Mexico. We'll share a link in the chat toward the end of the session and you'll be able to get instant CPD uh, after you complete a short survey and we really appreciate your feedback. It helps us to continue to improve these sessions. We will also share a social media guide in the chat so that those of you who are Twittering and using Facebook and Instagram and other social media outlets to, to help you to uh, do that. Again, for those uh, our colleagues who are Francophone, please go to the interpretation line and click on the French line. And when we come uh, to the point when our colleague who is presenting in French, uh, if you need English, go to the same little globe and click the English line. So with that, I'm gonna hand the microphone to Professor Smith, Vautrina. Sure. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, everyone, for being here. It's really wonderful to continue our series of One Health Echo updates. 
and being able to do this with Afrahoon and as part of the One Health Workforce Next Generation project that USAID is supporting has been a really productive and enjoyable activity to get together virtually with, with friends and colleagues from around the world. So, so thank you for being here. Our focus on diagnostic tests and approaches being used for COVID-19 is quite timely. And we had a very good session yesterday with our Southeast Asia colleagues at Siahoon and their stakeholders. So we'll continue on, on that dialogue. Um, but first, I think it would be very nice to hear a few welcome words um, from Dean Bezeo as the lead for Afrahoon. So Dean Bezeo, would you like to go ahead and, um, and go next? Thank you very much, Imotrina. And it's nice seeing all of you. And I would want to welcome all the participants. I see we have now reached about 137 participants. This is exciting. Uh, as we've been going through this the last few weeks, we noticed that a lot has been done and a lot has been accomplished in very many countries. I think it is very nice at this point to hear how people have been going through this diagnosis because it's very important to have the real diagnosis and then see how to move. Uh, but I'd like also want to thank the, the members who have participated in this, in their different capacities in the different countries, to see that we are coming towards controlling this pandemic. I'm excited that I no longer see very high numbers of deaths, meaning that there is quite a lot of improvement. And my hope is that we'll be able to defeat this, this virus. Uh, lastly, I'd like to welcome our speakers for accepting to come, more especially Professor Joroba, who has been doing the, the, the survey, the, the, the survey, the community survey all over the country in Uganda, and I think he's just returned, and to have accepted to come and tell us what he's doing and what his lab is doing and what the region is doing. Once again, you are welcome and we look forward to sharing a lot of views. Thank you. Thank you, Otrina, and my, my brother, Bruce, thank you for everything. Over to you. Okay, so we're going to go to Dr. Brian Bird, who's our moderator for today, to um, do his uh, standing global update slide and then to kick off the panel discussion. Dr. Bird, are you with us? I am, and it's great to be back with everyone. Uh, this is our fifth session, if you can believe it, uh, for these uh, Afrohoon Network uh, Echo sessions. And it's, as always, it is a pleasure to be here and share things with you as we work towards figuring out solutions to this great global pandemic that we're all in. And today's topic is one that I certainly uh, think a lot about, diagnostics. Uh, like many of you on the call, I've been involved in diagnostics for outbreaks for many, many years across Africa. So working well with my colleagues in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, DRC, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea uh, over the years and it's a fantastic lineup we have and I hopefully we'll learn a lot about diagnostic approaches used in different countries uh, from our colleagues and also from our global partner FIND to give us a, a global overview of diagnostics. So I have just a couple of update slides like usual for these just talking about the global situation for the pandemic. Uh, since we last spoke there's yet again another million cases that have been confirmed. Uh, so now we're at about 4.7 million cases. Uh, across the Afrohoon network countries, the numbers remain uh, low, about 9,121 cases as of a few days ago. Uh, sometimes I have several slides on updates that I thought were quite interesting, but to leave a lot of time for dialogue and discussion about diagnostics, I have only one a significant update, which was reported now two days ago from the Netherlands in Northern Europe, where they reported the uh, identification of what appears to be an animal to human transmission of SARS coronavirus 2 from farmed mink. And mink are small little creatures that are raised for their fur. 
and for other purposes. And minka related to ferrets, which we do know as an animal model can be experimentally infected. Uh, you can find more information by clicking on that link in my slide in the lower left there. And then in the right panel here is just the situational update from the African Union and Africa CDC um, on a country by country basis. Right. And of course, in the last slide of my deck, there's links to other resources, other websites and places you can find factual information about the pandemic. And with that, we're now going to transition to our first speaker who is Dr. Jillian Sachs uh, from FIND, and she's going to give us a global overview on diagnostics and what the great work they're doing at FIND to help us all understand the state of diagnostics around the world. So, Dr. Sachs, please. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, so just to begin, um, I wanted to set the stage a bit to describe kind of the truly unprecedented and unique situation we all find ourselves living through right now. Um, and to give a bit of context as to some of the activities that FIND is working on and, and some of the issues that you're all grappling with as you try to increase access to diagnostic testing in your own countries. So right now we see that healthcare infrastructure and testing capacity are really emerging as major issues in the COVID-19 response globally. Um, and this is because every country, both in the global north and the global south, is trying to contend with this emerging infection. So we know that adequate testing capacity is lacking worldwide. Um, and we also know that because of emerging cases in Europe and the US, um, which have overwhelmed their health systems, um, we are now seeing the consequences of that in the global south. And we're seeing that in more resource limited countries, for example, in Africa or Latin America, um, which already have more fragile healthcare systems, um, your countries become even more vulnerable to, to COVID-19. So many of you may not be familiar with FIND. Um, we are the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics. We're a global nonprofit based in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and we serve as a product partnership um, where we try to ensure uh, innovation for diagnostics that com to combat major disease areas that affect populations in resource limited settings. And one of the areas in which we work is pandemic preparedness. Um, so in response to COVID-19, we have several in, uh, initiatives um, and I've just listed a few of them here. We also have a lot of information on our website, um, which is noted below, um, but specifically relevant to today's conversation, we are doing um, rapid evaluations of new and existing tests for SARS-CoV-2. And we are doing this with a lens specifically of understanding their use for low and middle income country contexts, because we'd like to ensure that countries have a diverse supply available to them when you're trying to make procurement decisions, since we recognize that every country is currently trying to procure the same exact products. Um, we're also working on capacity development to um, help support laboratories uh, directly in country where needed. Um, and we also have two initiatives uh, to monitor the global pipeline of products. So um, we have a website that lists um, as many products as, as is out there. Suppliers can submit their products to us and we list them. Um, and that's for informational purposes. And we also are uh, working to drive development of new products that may fill gaps in the diagnostic um, system. Uh, to ensure that COVID-19 can be tested for, um, uh, to ensure that their response is adequate. So overall, uh, what is the goal of testing for COVID-19? This will vary depending on your country context. So as we heard in, in Dr. Bird's introduction, um, in most African countries right now, um, you might have sporadic cases or small clusters of cases um, and maybe certain areas where you have community transmission, but you don't have widespread community transmission throughout your entire country, which, which was the case in, in some of the other uh, global regions, for example, in Latin America right now. Um, so depending on this um, uh, epidemic context, the goal of testing is really to contain transmission and prevent spread or to just slow transmission when you really are dealing with a full-blown epidemic. Um, who should be tested? So uh, there are many guidelines out there. I'm just pulling from the World Health Organization in particular, um, which explains that you should use clinical, i.e. symptoms, as well as epidemiological factors, which means exposure risk, 
to ascertain the likelihood of infection, and then you test people accordingly. So PCR testing is our gold standard testing. Um, if you're going to test asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic contacts, um, you probably would want to prioritize the use of PCR testing. Um, there's also um, uh, the prioritization of ensuring rapid collection and testing of patients who meet the defined suspect case definition. Um, this is really a priority, not just for their own clinical management, which is critical, but as well as outbreak control so that you can trigger um, contact tracing, et cetera. So I'm just providing here a, a general overview of the different types of testing products that are currently available for COVID-19. Um, and then in subsequent presentations, we'll hear how individual countries are actually using these products. So there are molecular tests, um, which detect the presence of viral genetic material, aka uh, RNA. These are also called nucleic acid tests. Um, they are based on the process of polymerase chain reaction or isothermal amplification in which um, there is no uh, need for different temperature fluctuations. Um, these products are usually lab-based, although there are some devices that can be um, more decentralized to lower level labs, they still require laboratory infrastructure. Um, and, and molecular tests are most commonly used right now to, to, to test people suspected of having COVID-19, as well as to monitor their um, response. Um, I will also then explain that there are immunoassays. The immunoassays can detect either antibodies, which are the most widely available. Um, and as most of you would know, antibodies are a part of your body's immune response to the infection with COVID-19. Um, so there is a bit of a delay in, in between when you're infected and when those antibodies are, are produced and you can detect them. And then the antibodies persist. And so the detection of antibodies can indicate either active infection or previous infection. The immunoassays, uh, there are also available that detect the antigen of the antibody. So the antigen, um, are, the antigens are viral proteins that are produced as COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is replicating. And so the detection of antigens actually indicates active infection. Um, and then we also have um, non-disease specific um, tests. Um, these are things such as um, temperature thermal scanning or thermometers or imaging, which um, can uh, detect symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19, but would not be sufficient to actually diagnose the disease. Um, and depending on the uh, type of biomarker that you're looking for, these tests can be deployed in different settings. So the immunoassays generally, uh, if, if they're in a lateral flow format, so a rapid diagnostic test or RDT, can be used in very decentralized settings, or there are also higher throughput um, machine-based uh, instruments. Um, so just a brief overview of the samples that can be used for SARS-CoV-2 testing. So for molecular or antigen tests that are actually looking for the virus directly, the most common sample type right now are nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, and the image shown here just shows you um, the collection of, of this sample type. Um, other sample types that may be included include other swabs, such as oropharyngeal or nasal swabs. Um, there's also sputum, which would allow for a lower respiratory tract um, sampling. Uh, blood, which is, or uh, serum or plasma, which are used for serological tests. Saliva is emerging as a potentially very appealing sample type as it's very non-invasive to collect um, and could perhaps be used to detect RNA antigen as well as perhaps antibody. Um, stool and urine are also uh, sample types that are being explored in research contexts as well as bowel. Um, samples can be collected in various settings actually. So there are situations where there are visiting healthcare professionals that are going out into the community um, and can collect these swabs. There are um, dedicated drive-through centers uh, where people uh, uh, don't get out of their car, but they have the sample collected directly by a, a healthcare professional who is in appropriate protective gear. Um, and then most commonly, samples can be collected, obviously, at the hospital or clinic. Um, and then at least for molecular testing, these samples would have to be sent to a centralized laboratory. So I wanted to just briefly go over um, the uh, timing of expression of some of the biomarkers that I just mentioned, um, because it's quite relevant to which test you might want to select, depending on the use of that test and what you're looking for. So um, this is a cartoon from a recent article in JAMA. Um, and what the different colored lines show 
is um, the ability to detect a particular um, biomarker depending on the sample type that's being used with the dotted lines uh, showing the antibody timing of expression and the solid line showing the um, ability to either detect the virus through PCR or being able to actually culture infectious virus, which is the red line. And I think this is really an important point to note that you can see that there's a much longer window by which we can actually detect the presence of the virus, but it's a very narrow window where we can actually culture infectious virus. And this discrepancy um, might be quite challenging if you're thinking about when to discharge a patient. So a patient may be detectable, but they may not have infectious virus. And so what, what do you do about that? Um, maybe we can discuss that later. So I also wanted to just remind you that SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory pathogen, not a bloodborne pathogen, similar to some of the other viruses that may be more um, commonly combated in, in your context. Um, it's also been observed, as you can see with these dotted lines, um, that the typical immune response uh, that is seen for other viruses in which IgM, which is a type of antibody, usually comes up earlier than IgG, we're seeing that that's not the case with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and that has implications for uh, deciding whether you, uh, a person is in an early or a later response uh, to, the, to the virus. And it seems that right now we don't have a good marker to actually uh, distinguish that early versus late. Um, I also wanted to note, and this is a challenge that I'm sure many of us are, are grappling with, is that um, virus is, is, is present long before symptoms can actually be detectable. So if you're targeting screening for only symptomatic individuals, you obviously are going to miss um, a, a crucial window period um, where someone might be infectious and spreading virus. Um, and in fact, depending on the literature and countries and the context, it's estimated that between 6 and 44% of transmission may actually occur in this um, asymptomatic period. So I've just summarized here some of the main um, use cases for different test types. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's um, you know, some overarching um, uh, intended uses. So the main goal that most of you are probably considering right now is the confirmation of active infection. And obviously molecular testing is the gold standard for this. Um, there's consideration that antigen detection may also be able to do this, but this will depend on the performance of the antigen detecting tests, whether they're sensitive enough and specific enough. Um, and then really uh, antibody tests are likely not uh, appropriate for confirmation of active infection. And that's because of that window period that it takes your body to produce antibodies in response to the infection. Um, you also may want to consider triaging suspect cases. So trying to figure out if you have to do mass screening, you want to figure out quickly who either has or does not have COVID, and then you can um, move on to a confirmatory test. Um, antigen RDTs may be quite appropriate for that, again, depending on their performance. Um, as I mentioned, monitoring disease progression really is probably best done using nucleic acid testing although there is consideration that as a person develops an antibody response, that is an indication that they're um, recovering from the virus and that might be helpful to know. Um, and then uh, antibody testing is also being shown to be an important aid in diagnosis in symptomatic cases. There, so there are some people who remain PCR negative because uh, their virus uh, remains in their lower respiratory tract. And if you're uh, taking an upper respiratory tract uh, sample, you may miss their um, uh, detection of their virus. And so uh, development of antibodies will still happen in those individuals and, and having a positive antibody test in the presence of symptoms um, and perhaps in the presence of um, uh, chest uh, uh, imaging that shows uh, uh, symptomology consistent with COVID-19 may be sufficient to diagnose. Um, as well, for public health measures, it's important to screen contacts. Um, to at least do, to do contact tracing, and then you may want to consider certain testing. Um, screening contacts for uh, active infection would probably best be accomplished using an antigen rapid test um, as uh, collection and referral to PCR, especially in, in constrained uh, uh, times, may be impractical. And then if you want to just screen contacts for exposure, perhaps uh, at least seven to 10 days after they may have come in contact with an infected person, antibody-based testing would be best for that, as well as for population surveillance. And it sounds like we may hear a bit about um, surveillance in, in a later presentation. 
Um, so there are, as I mentioned, there's sort of an overwhelming number of diagnostic tests available. Um, FIND uh, is trying to capture the many tests that are out there to at least list them in one place. There are other groups that are also doing this, so I've listed a few other resources on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, but as you can see, there are many tests, and it's important to understand which tests are better than others and to then um, select tests that are appropriate for your country context. Um, so these are just a few notes that I put together on um, some key priorities for uh, selecting specific products once you have defined what you want to use a particular test for. So um, it is helpful to prioritize tests that have been assessed through a national emergency use authorization or through the WHO emergency use listing procedure. Um, I will note that each jurisdiction has different requirements for this emergency use author authorization. Um, so approval in one country may not be equivalent to another. Um, and as well, these emergency use authorization requirements are much less stringent than uh, product approval in non-epidemic times. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, we're also all moving very quickly and so are the, the companies who are making these products. And so you have to also keep that in mind. Um, it's important to select companies that meet quality management systems to ensure that they supply you with consistent products. Um, it might also be helpful given um, the challenges with supply chains that we're all experiencing to uh, prioritize tests that come from uh, existing distributors in your particular country um, because this may enable you to have better and more consistent access to testing kits. Um, it's important to understand what sample collection materials and other reagents or consumables are required to implement a test that may not be supplied with that test directly because you will need to obviously procure um, and access those as well. Um, and then it's important sometimes if you're not familiar with a product, you can ask a, a, the company for a copy of their instructions for use so that you can really understand what would be required to implement that product. Um, as I noted, uh, one of the efforts that FIND is doing is to, is to generate uh, performance data independently from the suppliers. Um, there are other groups that are also doing this. And so um, as you uh, may be contacted by different companies to um, consider their products, you may want to look at our website and others to see if there's any data available on the performance of that product, since it's probably infeasible for you to evaluate every single product that comes um, uh, up in conversation. Lastly, I'll just mention that um, FIND in partnership with the African Society for Laboratory Medicine, as well as the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, have put together a Future Learn course. This is an online course. It lasts about three weeks. Um, our first run of this course uh, launched at the end of April, and we're about to start a new launch of the course in mid-June. Um, and uh, I would encourage you, if you're interested in, in diagnostics for COVID-19, to, to sign up for this. Um, it's free to, to attend. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for their attention and, and the, the group for the opportunity to present. And um, please reach out to FIND at any time if you have questions or, or want to speak with us. And here's our um, generic email address for our pandemic preparedness team. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. That was great. A nice overview of the total state of affairs when it comes to diagnostics. Uh, lots of great information. I have several questions for you that I'll loop back to. But I think in interest of time, let's hear from all of our three speakers uh, first, and then we'll go into the question and answer session. I ask that uh, for our French speaking colleagues, that those of us that speak English primarily, we try to speak a little slower because it's hard to translate. I mean, that's, a, that's almost an impossible task. So uh, now I'll t turn the microphone over to you. Uh, Dr. Jaloba from Makareri uh, University in Uganda. I'm very excited to hear the things that are going on in your country and getting an update from you. So, uh, Dr. Jaloba, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm trying to see how whether the it is sharing it worked well it doesn't technology has well let's see so we can see your desktop screen and now we just need to find your powerpoint window screen and professor 
Jalobet Spruce, I'm happy to share your slides if that's easier for you, whichever you'd prefer. Please do. Okay. Yeah, I'll Maybe Bruce, if you guys can uh, put them up there and then uh, we can just advance them for uh, Dr. Yes. Jaloba. Ah, there we go. Okay, go ahead, Professor, and tell me when you want the next slide. Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. It looks like uh, I really want to appreciate Gillian Sachs from FIND. It has made my life very easy. So I will definitely concentrate on sharing my exp our experience in Uganda. And we'll see next slide. Okay, COVID, as I already mentioned, COVID-19 diagnostic testing must be timely and accurate. And I think the consequences of uh, of a, a wrong diagnosis or a delayed diagnosis are very big. In my experience, I've seen where a, a, a one positive case means the whole army barracks and the whole police barracks uh, get quarantined. So the consequences of this test is big. So you can't afford to make mistakes. It's you have to, to, to get it right as much as possible. And as you know, testing is very important for planning, prevention, management, surveillance, and research. And the most important recommendation for WHO is testing, testing, and testing. Next slide. So overall, this side has been covered by SACS. Let's go next slide. So it, much as uh, SACS has shown that a schema, I, I could still show it that it's also very, in terms of planning, it, it, it is still very complicated to see in each country what proportion of people are in the early stage who have PCR or antigen positive, or are in the later stage who have IgG and IgM, and who have both. This is very key to help in terms of planning and developing a robot. Next slide. Okay, My, these tests have been developed. I think where I can share a lot of experience is that for us in the developing country, we have challenges to adopt and adapt these techniques to our own environment. For example, we have challenges of biosafety and technical capacity, particularly when it comes to the manual PCR. And therefore, most of the time when it comes to that testing is centralized to a few centers. And if we, we do that, then there are challenges of transportation and also information management. And usually this involves a lot of volume of samples. Like a lab, one lab like I do, we receive 3,000 samples in a, in, a, in, a, in a day. And so it requires a robust uh, mechanism. And there are also challenges of supply and chain management. The factories are overwhelmed and there is limited air travel, which we knew usually we could get uh, supplies overnight, not anymore. And these uh, supplies are very costly given the testing volumes, which are high. And for that matter, also the COVID epidemic evolves very fast and it is difficult to forecast these, the need. So this brings a lot of challenges. And already mentioned we have challenges of verification of tests. This is a new disease. It's not clear to have a reference in the country. And there are various platforms with different performance. And therefore, there are also questions about quality. I, I have seen already colleagues have talked about false positivity and negativity rate, sensitivity and specificity. These all are challenges. Next slide. So in Uganda, this is how our sample flow goes. We collect samples, blood, onosopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab, or saliva. We have taken on saliva, which has been a very friendly sample. We have hubs across the country. So the samples are transported to the hubs where they are processed and repackaged. The plan is to have testing, for example, RDT and Gene Expert done there, but we are yet to validate good RDTs and also have enough cartridges to do that. So predominantly samples are 
shift in the testing lab, which does a quantitative real-time PCR. Some of them, and like our lab, we have a sample repository where we keep those samples, particularly blood, and we could wait when we get new techniques. Next slide. This map shows the 100 hubs in Uganda, which are uh, generally distributed around. So a sample is taken to these hubs by a motorcycle, commonly known as a border border. And from there, samples are driven to the central lab. These hubs are very handy and made out very, very easy to, to cover the whole country. Next slide. This is one of our lab in Makerere University where sample reception and sorting and inactivation occurs. This is from a BSL-3. You can quickly say this is an adaptation from a, an already an existing TB lab, a, BS, a BSL-3 lab, which we have converted into a reception center for COVID. You can see the samples in the packages. Next slide. This is an RNA extraction lab. Given the volumes of the samples, we have uh, many people working at various small workstations to speed up activity. Next slide. These are amplification lab, and these are four real-time PCRs. All together, they can do 300 samples per hour, so that by the end of the day, you could be able to do up to 6,000 tests on a day and night shift. Next slide. We have a repository where we keep these samples for confirmed patients and SERA, which is very important in speeding up verification of tests and maybe for future research. Next slide. This is a, a, a lab where the data is analyzed, is exception so that it is speeds up linking back to the patients. Some results are sent back electronically. Next slide. This is the gene expert, again, adapting on already an existing lab with 16 modules of gene expert. It was very easy to verify the COVID expert express cartridge, and it's very handy and very easy to use. Next slide. So as I've told you, I think my friend has shown you that there are many RDTs on the market, and they have already said there is a challenge in validating and putting this in the on the on the for, on the field, especially under emergency conditions. Next slide. Okay. Next. Continue. 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 So here we. Oh. <laughs> okay. So we had to quickly develop a reference panel, and the samples stored in a, a biopostal were very good. So we could get uh, samples which, which are were positive by both expert and manual PCR, and were also positive on more than two other DTs, and those were positive. And we looked at samples which were in the repository collected over five years ago, and we termed them negative to, be co to construct a reference. Next slide. This just summarizes the result. If you look at this uh, uh, table, uh, you, you could see the RRDTs being evaluated is A, B, C, and D. And in the second column, you see the ex expected results. So those, those are negative results on the upper panel. And then the red down are positive, supposed to be positive. So you can see the performance of kit A is very, very bad. Kit B and C have a fairly good performance. And this D is a little, little not good. But surprisingly, you could see some lighting up in the negative samples which we are collected more than five years ago, meaning that we have really to cross reactions either with other coronaviruses or we just don't know. So it makes, it makes it very complicated to verify these kits. Next slide. Okay, next slide. These are examples of, of tests. So quickly, because of the lack of, uh, of reagents and money, we've post-explored back testing, because, and this is pooling samples. Next slide. This slide shows a two-fold dilution, looking at what you could do if you add a positive one beginning at a CT of 13.7 and diluted it two-fold, up started to fold, and you could still detect. Next slide. And this is the five-fold 
uh, dilution up to about 625 dilutions, and we could still see detect the virus. So this pooled testing is one of our backup strategy in case we are getting run short of supplies. I, I think, next slide. So with that, I really want to thank you and share the, our experience. It's not a, 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 an easy thing, but thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you, Dr. Jaloba. That was fantastic. Not only did you show incredible depth and strength of the Ugandan testing system and your 100 hubs, and I have some questions about that that I'll get back to, but also the ongoing and rapid validation of different tests and uh, looking at batching and pooling of specimens, which I also have some questions for. So that's just fantastic. Shows the power of doing research uh, in all of our countries to inform all the rest of us about the amazing advances that each of us come up with. So uh, with that, let's continue on with Dr. Faye from Institut Pasteur Dakar in Senegal. Uh, please, Dr. Faye, I'll turn the microphone over to you and uh, let's hear from you the situation in West Africa and what's going on in your institute. Please, sir. And Brian, as Professor Fay is coming on, just a reminder to the Anglophones, if you want to hear the interpretation, you'll need to go down to the little interpretation globe and click the English line. Uh, thank you. Do you hear me? Vous m'entendez? Yes, Professor. Okay. Uh, let me put the slide. Can hear you? Okay, I can move now. Uh, yes. Let me share the slide. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Do you have the slide now? We yes, we do. Okay. Uh, after the two speaker English, it is I move to the French speaker English. But sorry, but I have I have my slide in in, in, in English for, for the for, for the English speaker. But I, I can move now for the for the for the French. Don't I will present now the diagnostic point a strategy in Senegal, you the strategy used and share with you what we have noticed in the field and with the best practices. That will be I will talk about uh, preparation with, uh, with regards to lab situation in Senegal, diagnostics and, and in innovation that will be put in place and how to, uh, pre to prepare for the next pandemics and epidemics. There will be also other epidemics. So you always have to prepare for the next one. I just wanted to show that at the beginning we had done trainings, diagnostic trainings. There were only two labs. We had to organize training with different countries, with the Africa CDC uh, coordinating it, and OAO, CDAO. So we had to do trainings in different countries to share experiences and, and, and to share kits, diagnostic kits. And also, after that, there was the implementation of, of Senegal. And so to, so to, for, for an update of the situation COVID-19 with regards to diagnostics, we have more than 2016, 2,600 cases confirmed. So we analyzed like 35,000 samples during these two months. So here you have the curve and the, uh, in, in, uh, the increase of cases in the, the uh, last days. So. Tex testing samples 
uh, increase by 10. So with, a, with regards to testing and preparation, there are several different levels. There's reorganization and innovation and testing, tests done in labs and di sharing of results. And samples come from everywhere. So, <clears throat> so we have to organize so the results can go back to the users. And also we have to decentralize because we, the one lab at Dakar isn't enough. There are other, we work to decentralize labs. Uh, in the field, closer to the field. And we, we want also to develop tests, diagnostic tests, and these tests can contribute to increase uh, access, geographic access to diagnostic tests. So with regards to testing, we are organized at the IDP, 1,100 to 1,200 tests a day, more than 24 people working 24-7 uh, and automation also, you know that diagnostic is with uh, PCR, real-time PCR. So it sometimes it can take a lot of time. So we have uh, automa automatic extraction and extract of, uh, a good part of the um, uh, genetic material. We also put a platform in place at district level when samples are collected, when they arrive to the lab, results is shared in real time. So they have a platform to visualize results. This is essential. There are other activities also. After the uh, diagnostic, the sequencing to show, see the evolution of, uh, of uh, the various uh, strands when there are chains that are not well known, it is important to do sequencing to establish these links. Evaluation of diagnostic uh, assays. A speaker talked about the TDRs. There are many RDTs on the market now. There's nothing that we can use 100% of the time. Sensibility is, is varies, and there's also the clinical aspect. We work with uh, for on uh, clinical pro protocols to see if there's an evolution in pa patients. So here, this is the digital platform that we implemented to visualize results at every level. There's a person inputting the data, lab, the lab after the results, a, a party, a part of the analysis is done by other people. In real time, results are shared by and uh, implemented by and put into the system by different users. So the strategy, diagnostic strategy, this in Senegal, in the Institut Pasteur, we have a, a lab in Dakar, but in the middle, you have a lab in a, a Kolda in the south. There's a third lab and, and the itinerary uh, lab where there are, where there are hotspots. Uh, so a mobility lab, a mobile lab. So this is the strategy that we implemented to cover the entire country with lab access. So I talked about activities. So development of diagnostic tools. We're working on this with partners. The objective is to develop diagnostic tools. There are two levels. Diagnostics based on antibodies and rapid tests on antigen based. So we're trying to evaluate what is already available with regards to sensibility. 
So we think that with regards to the, the, these diagnostics, there are different levels. You have to inform authorities so they can invest because there are different levels to prepare and manage the, the outbreak. But there's the second point is the, the, with COVID, the, another aspect for the management of these epidemics, the One Health in developing manufacturing capacities for, and take uh, appropriate measures. I'm done, thank you. And I hope I wasn't too long. Maybe we can come back. If you have questions, we can come back. Over. All right, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fahey. That was a great overview of uh, the nice uh, work being done uh, in, uh, in uh, Senegal. Uh, so it's yeah. great. So now we've heard from our three speakers. And uh, now I want to ask a few questions. I'll start off the questions. And then I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, the other participants, your questions. So you can always type them in the chat box. And we have been noting some that have gone along and things. So I think uh, let's start with uh, back to Dr. Jaloba uh, in Uganda. So you mentioned your your system and I uh, of network of labs and your Boda Boda network and the way you're moving specimens. And let's start there. Uh, in that it's clear that this, ch the challenge of COVID-19 is there are so many cases, but also so many people we need to test. And how do we manage uh, this distributed laboratory testing network? All right, so I'd like to hear from you, Dr. Jaloba, and then I'll come back to Dr. Faye and hear your thoughts more on that, on how we decentralize the testing in your country and how that's going and any key lessons learned you might want to share with other folks on the line. Uh, Dr. Jaloba. Thank you very much. I agree with you that the testing volumes are high, either just to make sure that you are doing surveillance. So in a country like Uganda, we have two challenges. One, the main uh, uh, cases are still imported. My, the airport has been uh, closed apart from the cargo, but then the roads are, are now the trucker drivers and people bringing in cargo are the biggest source of infection. So that was a big challenge. As of now, some of the major borders we have put gene experts, and those gene experts help in terms of testing so that the decisions can be made there and then. Otherwise, sending the samples centrally meant that the drivers would sit there for two or three days and the trucks were going up to 28 kilometers waiting to be cleared through the border entrance. So that the gene experts have helped a little bit on the major ones, but unfortunately we don't have enough cartridges to cover all the 53 formal crossing border points. Remember there are also informal border crossing points because it is very porous. So there is a challenge in there. However, inland, if there is, during the surveillance, which Professor Vazeo has mentioned, we, we are, have just been leading a rapid uh, community transmission assessment across the whole country. The hubs came in very handy because wherever we were, we could easily collect samples, take to the hubs, repackage them, and send them centrally. The original plan was to do the gene expert because all the hundred subs have a gene expert, have biosafety cabinet. So they were ready to go for doing COVID. Unfortunately, we could not get the cartridges we needed in time. So they packaged, they separated the plasma and serum and sent the samples centrally. However, they also helped in bringing logistics because every day the vehicles come back bring the logistics for the team and the labs to continue moving. So going forward, I think it's a very well set up system that if we get all we need, especially the cartridges, they will be fine. Of course, we are grappling with how to place the RDTs. 
currently we are only using them for surveillance purposes to look at exposure because their performance in terms of detecting active cases is still a challenge to us. I, I hope I have responded yeah. this. No, thanks. You, you brought up a lot of good issues on the supply chain. Uh, so perhaps Dr. Faye, let's, let's take the same kind of question. So you have your at least four partner labs across Senegal uh, that are helping with the testing. How are you working through supply chain issues uh, in Senegal? If there's any insights you might have or things that we could think about in our other countries for the people listening in. Dr. Faye. Euh, merci beaucoup. Donc, je pense que euh, par, par rapport effectivement à, à, à cet aspect, c'est une question très, très, très importante parce que du point de vue... With regard to logistics, it is very important because we need, with regard to reagents, reagents, we need other equipment. So there's a tension international intention to procure reagents and etc. This means that we will have to analyze things differently. And during activities with Africa the CDC, we were able to have some reagents. So preparation is very important at this level also. And what gene expert it's a, it's a good tool. It can be used in very remote areas. But really, uh, the, the, we only have 500 cartouches. Others will come, but this is an important element. So if we have uh, the availability of gene experts, uh, that would be good other lesson, we would need a good preparation because the lab is a good element, but component, but, but preparation is also important. We, when there are diseases, we try to decentralize. There are a lot of lab, labs who want to participate, but organization is important. Results are positive and negative we need to validate them. So globally, this is what I see. The message I have with regard to this epidemics for African countries, they should be better prepared and certain independence for certain aspects. If we're waiting for everything, reagents and etc. with this uh, epidemics, other countries might need it more we had orders that were blocked in other countries by US uh, authorities. So we have to see how we can solve this. This is what I wanted to add on this question that was uh, uh, presented. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fai. That's a distributed uh, across the continent and elsewhere around the world, but the Achilles heel is the logistic for that type of more rapid diagnostic. Uh, the Cepheids are great in context of Ebola outbreaks. Uh, my background is in Ebola diagnostics, uh, but when we have global pandemics, uh, we all have to be very creative and, as you said, prepare well in advance uh, to ensure that we have enough of the kit, enough of the reagent and things around. And that's a real challenge when the entire world is trying to get more and more reagent and, and uh, testing equipment. Uh, so some of the other questions that have come up that are, are I think, quite key for this discussion are in, uh, things about sensitivity and specificity of assays, uh, uh, data that we've seen of people that were tested negative and then released and then uh, we test intermittently positive again. And I'm wondering if Dr. Sachs from FIND could talk us through that uh, understanding of what's going on in that situation and 
uh, both in the, from the patient perspective and those that become intermittently positive again, but also a little bit about your work in comparing across assays for sensitivity and specificity and how that is important when we look at a population uh, type surveillance activity that we're in now. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. Sure, thank you. So I'll start with the molecular test because I think that's what we're talking about when we uh, are worried about this intermittent positivity. So as everyone here is familiar with, the PCR tests that we use for nucleic acid testing are very sensitive. They're able to take a very small, detect a very small amount of virus through the amplification process. And so oftentimes when we have these intermittent positives, there is an expectation that perhaps this is remnant viral genetic material that is no longer representative of an active infection um, that the test is actually picking up. Um, so I think there's still a lot of um, emerging research as to whether anyone is truly reinfected in such a small window of time or whether perhaps um, their, uh, their course of infection is just um, proceeding over uh, many weeks. Um, and I, as I think I showed in, in um, the uh, JAMA um, uh, graph, you can see that viral material can be detected many weeks after the virus is no longer infectious in the person. Um, so I think it is, it is a challenging issue if you detect someone as positive, but they no longer have symptoms and, and you don't need to keep them in the hospital anymore. How do you safely um, tell them to go home um, and not be concerned that they may spread infections to others? But I think after about two weeks or so, it's really pretty unlikely that the person is infectious. Um, when it comes to comparing sensitivity and specificity, it will matter which test type we're talking about. So for the nucleic acid test, what we've been doing is, um, you know, similar to um, what Dr. Jaloba showed, um, it's important to get well-characterized specimens from known PCR-positive clinical samples and then historic controls when the virus was not circulating. That's the best control for knowing whether there truly is no virus. Um, so that's what we've been doing for our evaluations of nucleic acid tests is we're using those clinical specimens as well. We are using cultured virus where we um, can figure out known quantities of the virus um, and then we can understand the relative analytical sensitivity and specificity of the nucleic acid tests that we're analyzing. Um, and some of that data that we've generated is on our website. Um, when it comes to the serological tests, which Dr. Jaloba very nicely walked through what um, Uganda has been doing to validate those products, um, as has been pointed out in, in the chat box as well as in our session last night, um, there's no gold standard for these serological tests and we don't actually have um, reference materials that we can use. So what we've been doing, and I, very similar to what Uganda is doing, is we're trying to get um, serum from different patients according to different course of disease. So one of the really critical factors when assessing the performance of these antibody tests is the days from symptom onset. So if you look at a patient who they may be very symptomatic, but it's very early in their infection, it is very unlikely that any antibody test, no matter how good it is, will actually detect antibodies because your body just hasn't mounted them yet. So it's not a question that the test is poorly designed, it's biologically impossible to detect something if it's not there. So if you look at a lot of specimens early on, you will get lots of what seem to be false negatives if you're comparing it to the PCR result. Um, furthermore, we, there are some questions about the specificity of these serological tests and whether there's a lot of cross-reactivity with other SARS, um, with other coronaviruses or other circulating viruses. Um, what we have seen generally is that there is pretty limited cross-reactivity in, in a lot of the tests. And so um, I think we do feel confident that there will be high specificity tests that can be used. And this is really critical for a lot of the seroprevalence surveys that you um, all are interested in, in doing and need to do. You wanna have a very specific test so that you can feel comfortable that when you're detecting a positive, it is a true positive. It is not someone who had some other um, non-pathogenic coronavirus that's already, that's already in circulation. Um, the one other thing that I'll mention is it's important for these uh, validations to get some sort of geographic diversity. So I think it's really great 
Um, you know, Uganda has a, a lot of stored samples. If other countries have stored samples where you can also uh, validate this similar products using your own specimens, that level of diversity will help us to understand the, the performance of these assays much more rapidly than if just one country does it. So I guess it's a plea to share your data as you generate the, the information. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Sachs. I think that's an important point uh, is that, you know, here in this, this forum, uh, we're all part of the One Health workforce, right? We're all working together uh, in our countries or across our regions, uh, both Afrohoon, Sayahoon, so both Africa, Asia, to try to understand uh, in particular this virus and this disease. There's so many things we do not know. Uh, I could see a question about the duration that antibodies will remain detectable. Well, we simply don't know that because uh, we're quite literally, if the first cases were in December, we're now in May, and that's only five to maybe six months. Uh, you know, we usually think about IgG durations in terms of years, and it will take years before we know what that would be. Uh, so these are real fundamental challenges, and that's a great opportunity for everyone here as laboratory scientists and epidemiologists and other workers to think forward about how would you monitor that? How could you find out more about what's going on in your country and situation? So I wanna turn the conversation a little bit towards training because this is a training uh, project, the One Health Workforce Next Gen US Aid uh, project uh, to develop this workforce. And I'm curious to hear from uh, Dr. Jaloba and Dr. Faye how you uh, went about training your laboratory staff in the countries uh, to go to pivot from uh, maybe doing tuberculosis testing or other disease testing to now COVID-19. Uh, what was the system you put in place and how did you rapidly do that? But, uh, so Dr. Jaloba, do you want to start us with that one about training of your staff to do the work uh, for COVID-19? You, uh, Brian, you, I have very, very interesting stories to <laughs> tell you here. Actually, let me begin with that interesting site. When, because we, and at Makerere University, we do have a BSL-3 now. My staff who do TB, they knew this was a BSL-2 kind of organism. So they said, you are very ready to do COVID work. And they, we put in a request for supplies and reagents. And before we knew it, we had a COVID patients. And then I said, we're now going to get COVID at samples, it was very difficult. The, the, the workers were very hesitant and some of them didn't turn up <laughs> because they, <laughs> not, until, not until I offered myself to do the first uh, lab experiments. And I reactivated them. And I think now the, the problem is the other way around. I have to remind them about safety. So, the, <laughs> so, so actually, training, where we have done training, we have done it in two, two parts. For example, the first, the most challenging training is to train people in a local down situation, where you have to look to train people across the country to collect samples, pack them at transport. That, during local down, we have to use online training and uh, so that like Zooms and videos and demonstration, and then send them supplies. That, kind of has worked. Of course, the government sometimes also gave us a leeway to send some experts with clearances to, to help them. So that was one part. But we already used some people who are knowledgeable about nosopharyngeal swab or pharyngeal swab taking. And that's why saliva came in handy in that direction. The other thing was to train on the centralized testing. Of course, gene expert was not a problem, apart from handling the samples in the safety and inactivation, the rest of the things were very easy to, to really, people were using gene expert for TB. But the, the real-time PCR, they are, the training needs to be very carefully done, and uh, especially handling the results to prevent cross-contamination and enough controls. But still, again, we are using already experienced people who are molecular biologists. So it is, was easy to pass on this knowledge. And the university, is, I think, is a natural place to adopt new things because we have a, a luxury of certain 
graduate students in molecular biology. So they were very, and they were very eager to, to come on board. So that is the experience I have from Uganda. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that's a great uh, teachable moment when uh, you're the leader of a lab. Uh, I, I do feel strongly if, if there's hesitancy in the tech, technical staff, then you should be present and doing the work to sh hand in hand with them. I know from my experiences on Ebola's and others, that's a very critical confidence building measure uh, to show them that the work can be done safely and effectively. That, that's great. Uh, Dr. Faye in Senegal, uh, do you want to share some of your thoughts on right. how you've trained uh, people there to do testing? Over to you. D'accord, donc en fait, pour, pour l'Institut Passeur, donc euh, nous, on n'a pas eu de problème. Donc, en fait, par rapport à la... With regard to training, because it was an activity that was already included in our activities at the... We have a National Reference Center for uh, Influenza and Respiratory illness, Illnesses. So there was the routine activities. There were already people who had experience for that with regards to field activities we had a surveillance system implemented for fs syndrome syndrome surveillance in senegal there are sentinels spread out in senegal people trained to do samples uh, oral and nasal samples they trained other people when there were more cases so it was a system that was already implemented in the field. So we just reinforced that team at the lab level. There was, so, because of the volume, we enforced teams. It was a person that was already used to do bio, bio, molecular biology for uh, other virus, viruses. So we reinforced the team. There are other trainings also at the beginning of the epidemics. There are other countries didn't have this experience with regards to respiratory uh, diseases. So we organized uh, trainings with co African colleagues to share our experience. So that was about, about uh, sharing experience, but these were activities that we had. And there's a bigger volume so we have uh, other people in a structure that was already there thank you yeah, thank you dr faye yeah it's uh, Merci, dr faye uh, i think it's important uh, Je pense que important this uh, around the world many agencies supporting work across our countries to have networks in place already uh, that's the key thing. Uh, I think we all know as laboratory workers that it takes quite a lot of time to train someone to be able to do diagnostics. Uh, it's, that's a years long process to really get them good at it and to develop the system that's there. Uh, you know, you, the build, building the building is just the first step. Having the biosafety cabinet is just one step. It's having the brains inside to do the testing. That's the hard part. And keeping those brains and those people engaged is, is critical. Uh, the whole system will fall apart right before your very eyes if the people lose motivation. So uh, thank you for, for those uh, perspectives. I, I'm, I'm curious uh, also to hear, you know, this is a global pandemic. Uh, obviously, perhaps the most impactful disease we've had on the world uh, if you look at it from disease perspective, economics, uh, in such a rapid time frame. But there are many other important diseases, uh, HIV, tuberculosis, other uh, tropical diseases, uh, the ongoing uh, outbreak of Ebola in Eastern DRC, uh, right on the border with Uganda. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could speak to how our, our shift of emphasis uh, to COVID-19 diagnostics because uh, like in Mecarere, you're testing 6,000 specimens a day or up to, uh, how has that impacted testing for other diseases? And are there strategies we can use to think ahead to make sure we're not completely neglecting the other important diseases while we fight this fire? 
so I, I'll just start back with you, Dr. Jaloba, and hear your uh, perspectives on that. What about the other diseases? Well, Brian, you have really brought a very good question. And I hope Professor Bazeo is listening <laughs> because we can share this <laughs> together. So this is a real difficult question because COVID has not only taken, because there is no COVID specialist. So we had to get already people who are available to turn them into dealing with COVID. So already it has taken the human resource. It has taken the infrastructure, as I've shown you, the, 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 the TB lab, molecular lab. It has taken the hubs. It has, so in a, in a way, at this point in time, we are in, during an emergency response. And we, even the expert machines we have shipped it to the border are TB machines, they are EID machines. And the, the CFID is no longer, even if you want to buy more, they are not available at this point in time. So in a way we are operating in an emergency mode. And I have, as you said, the DRC, we are, we are on alert for another Ebola attack. And they are the same surveillance people, same surveillance unit. So, I think at this point in time, we just focusing on disease. Although I think there are some advantages because these are also some of these diseases are diseases of public health. If you go for a local down, sometimes there could be or improved hand washing, sanitization, putting on masks. There could be some reduction in the other diseases at the same time as you are trying to deal with COVID. And I think we have kind of seen such a thing, maybe not, not fully, fully evaluated, that could help. But frankly, this is where we have to think, how do we mitigate the effects of COVID-19 on other health and uh, other health related things? And countries are beginning to do that. But remember, all the economies are in ruins. And uh, so it's a real challenging question. I, I hope I had an answer, but we have to think that. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Jaloba. It's a exceptionally complicated problem. Uh, it, it just it boggles the mind how uh, impacting this has been on us. Uh, Dr. Fai, how about in Senegal, uh, your, your experiences on the other diagnostics and the impacts uh, and what you are planning to do at Institut Pasteur, because I know it's a, that in itself is a network of networks of labs. Are there plans to uh, keep other testing going uh, for other diseases? Over to you, sir. Bon, je pense que chez, pour l'Institut Pasteur, on est toujours dans, il y, a, il, y a, il, y a, il y a un plan, en tout cas, de développement des de tests. Donc, parce qu'effectivement, au niveau de notre, de, notre, de notre département, il y a plusieurs niveaux. Il y a un volet uniquement qui s'occupe du développement des tests. Donc, ça peut être des tests de biologie moléculaire, ça peut être des tests sérologiques, etc. Ce n'est pas uniquement même dans les virus respiratoires, parce que nous, nous travaillons sur quatre grands groupes de virus. Il y a le premier groupe, c'est le groupe des virus respiratoires. Deuxième groupe, c'est tout ce qui est arbovirus et virus de fièvre hémorragique. Troisième groupe, c'est tout ce qui est virus entérique. Et quatrième groupe, c'est tout ce qui est des virus encéphalitiques. Donc voilà. Et donc, il y a toutes des stratégies, en tout cas de développement de tests, en tout cas qu'on fait aussi bien moléculaire que biologique, que biologique. Mais également dans le cadre d'un réseau, parce qu'effectivement, nous appartenons à un réseau de, de, de l'OMS qui a mis en place un réseau pour les laboratoires. Mais il y a également euh, l'OAS, donc qui a également mis en place un réseau de laboratoires pour lesquels, effectivement, nous jouons un centre de référence au niveau régional. Et donc, ça également, ça veut dire également appuyer d'autres pays. Ça veut dire que développer des concepts, voir effectivement un outil de développement et donc, effectivement, continuer à travailler dans le cadre de ce réseau. Je pense que ça, c'est un élément très important parce qu'on doit être, en tout cas, ensemble. On doit s'entraider, unir nos forces. Je pense que c'est ça, en tout cas, la clé en tout cas, de, de, du développement des laboratoires au niveau, de la, au niveau africain. Voilà, ça, c'est un peu les quatre points que je voulais apporter. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Faye. Yeah, it's a, 
Very, very important considerations uh, for all of us to think about uh, as we move forward. It's nice to hear that the, the, the networks that you are involved in are engaged and that that is important. And this, this art here, these people that you're looking at on the screen are also a network of colleagues and resources of information and uh, uh, advice, but also just support. Uh, we're all struggling and coping ourselves with the psychosocial impacts of the outbreak, whether it be on our work, in the labs, working 24 seven, 6,000 tests a day, uh, to just trying to manage things at home uh, with, the, with the tough economy. So reach out to your friends. Don't think that you're in this alone, of course, right? Uh, so I, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Sachs a question, I think, about uh, right now we're in the emergency acute phase of diagnostics, if you will. <laughs> Eventually, we want to get over to the, what you might call the convalescent stage of the pandemic. And how do you see the use of diagnostic uh, technologies, uh, whether it be the serologies or RDTs or things, to get us, once we're over this gi giant hump, how do we test our way out of the pandemic uh, from a regional or country level? Uh, what's the uh, uh, thinking it find on that? Thank you. Great, it's a very important question. And I think um, some of what um, our previous speakers have mentioned will be critical. So having a tiered laboratory structure where you're able to um, ensure that there's sentinel surveillance out in a particular community, being able to rely on that to then feed up to your central lab so that you can identify hotspots as they arise will be critical. Um, and I think relying on a diversity of test types, so saving your molecular testing to truly confirm infection, whereas using your antibody-based testing to be able to do those surveillance activities will also be very useful. Um, so I think we all hear in the news about um, the importance of serology testing. And I think getting the right tests defined um, and the right way to use those tests, so what their limitations are, um, for example, maybe not to test anyone who is less than seven days post exposure, might not, it might be a poor use of an antibody test. Um, and as well, uh, understanding the duration of those antibodies, as was already uh, mentioned, um, and we should be getting more and more of that data. So I think having a combinatorial approach between a strong laboratory-based system where you can actually confirm diagnosis using your nucleic acid tests, but then having more decentralized um, access to surveillance activities so that you can identify changes in case load and then target your public health measures to, to contain the spread of any outbreaks will be most critical. Um, and I think the question that you posed previously around how do we ensure the continu continuation of um, testing for other diseases is also going to be critical. So as has been mentioned, a lot of the machines that are currently in use for COVID are normally used for flu surveillance or for HIV viral load testing or early infant diagnosis. And figuring out within your own country how you can ensure um, a, a balance between um, ensuring surveillance for COVID but also taking care of all the other infectious diseases that you need uh, uh, to manage that are relevant to your context will be critical. And, and I think some um, you know, forecasts where you figure out what you expect your demand for tests to be for each of these different test types, and then thinking through perhaps some sort of schedule where you say, okay, in the mornings we test for X, Y, and Z, in the evenings we test for X, Y, and Z, might be a way to balance uh, these efforts while considering the diversity of protective equipment that's required depending on the type of pathogen you're, you're handling. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for and that. And I'm sure our colleagues in country might have some additional uh, considerations here. Yeah, I, I think that would be a great way to end. We have a, just a few minutes left for the Q&A. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, let's hear from uh, Dr. Fai and Dr. Jaloba about how they see uh, yeah, at some point in the future, <laughs> when we transition from what we're doing now to the to the next step, 
Uh, what do you think that might look like uh, for your countries? And uh, we'll just uh, start with Dr. Jalova again. That'd be great. So please, sir, uh, just, just a few minutes time here. Yeah, I think, Brian, that, that is exactly we begin to look at the future. Of course, <laughs> Brian, we have to look at the future, but in some of the countries, the worry is that it's going to be get worse, worse before it becomes <laughs> better and better. <laughs> because, <laughs> but I think like uh, our colleague Gillian Sachs has said, I think we really need to look at that. And just hopefully the way it is going that the epidemic will be cooling down in other places as we get into it and probably the supply chain logistics become better. We get more, more tests. Then the issue of decentralizing and having antibody tests which are more working better, that's the hope, to, to put them down lower and having at close to point of care and gene experts and, and actually training and more, more labs and more personnel. I think that is the way to go. And personally, who have just done a rapid assessment survey, what Gillian said is very important that we monitor, uh, do sentinel monitoring and have foci and identify them early. And then we put our effort there or do restricted lockdowns so that we get, don't get overwhelmed as, the, as a country. I think that is, to me, some of the strategies we are looking at. Thank you. Oh, yeah, th thank you for that. Uh, that. That's wonderful. It looks like Dr. Fai uh, may have had a technical challenge. He seemed to have disappeared from my screen. Um, so apologies for not being able to loop back to him for a parting thought on that. But uh, let's uh, turn it back to Dr. Smith. We're pretty much at time for this session. Uh, thank you all so much from myself uh, for hearing your perspectives from your countries, the great questions in the chat box. And of course, many questions we didn't get to answer here, but we will work on them in our uh, uh, frequently asked questions link, which is in the chat box there. Uh, so if you want follow-up answers, those will be there. So back to you, Dr. Smith uh, and uh, Dean Vizeo. Yeah, just a quick thank you from me to all the speakers and to everyone who's logged on today and shared your ideas and questions um, in the chat box and, and with the microphones. I think it was it was a very rich dialogue and we're very appreciative to work together on these types of challenges. Um, so that's lovely. The, the two week session from now, the next One Health Echo, will focus on immunity and intervention updates. So that will be a chance to build on some of the initial ideas that have been shared and, and questions that were asked. So we would invite everyone to join us in two weeks for our next session. And then I would love to hear uh, in the last minute or so, any comments that Dean Bazea would like to share with us. Thank you very much, Wolfina. Thank you, Brian. It was great. And you were as good as the presenter because you gave us a lot of experiences from, from your side. Thank, thank you, Sachs and Moses and Faye. I think I want to end up with this. Brian, you have concerned about what is going to happen. We have overwhelmed the system now. I think if we are going to survive, we need to work together. The countries, the regional countries, need to work with, together, use the resources that are available now, and we share them. Given what Moses said, that all of us have put in all the labs, all the equipment, the infrastructure that has been in place. So we need to share this, what is available, and then we move on. Thank you very much, all of you, and thank you for attending. We look forward to seeing you again in two weeks' time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody.